Welcome to the Peace Haven Weekly Podcast. Weekly message audio from Peace Haven Baptist Church in North Wilkesboro, North Carolina. We continue our study in Romans, with this sermon entitled, Suffering and Glory. We thank you for listening and be sure to visit us at www.findpeace.today. We've been going through chapter 8 in Romans and... Um, really when we looked at kind of a, an outline of, of things, Romans chapter 6 through chapter 8 is about how being in Christ um, affects our lives. It, it changes our lives for the better. And it's very important to understand that there are uh, immediate benefits now uh, and then there are, are future promises uh, to come, things that we are, are waiting for uh, as believers. And so those immediate benefits um, to those that are in Christ uh, is that Jesus took our punishment and, and we received His righteousness. And, and we talked about that great exchange um, that happens when we put our, our faith in the, the work that Jesus has done on our behalf. Um, we're no longer under the uh, demand or penalty of the law, uh, the law that says if you don't live this way, if you don't keep that standard, um, then you you die, you're separated from God. Um, And and we've looked at how that's a a law that we can't keep, a standard that we can't um, hope to attain to. Um, And so we are in Christ, we're given a a new life, a new identity. And then last week we said that we're, we're brought into a new family. And so we looked at a illustration that, that Paul gave from, from his day, um, and I, I think I have time for this, um, just to share something that's really neat as you study um, Scripture. Um, if you'll notice, Paul is, is, is primarily um, an apostle to the Gentile people, right? But he, he speaks to both Jewish and Gentile, and so... As he's talking about not being under the law and, and being in Christ, um, he gives two examples, and they're kind of back-to-back, and, and I really hadn't realized that until um, kind of seeing that over the past couple of weeks. But if you remember, he gives the example to like his Jewish audience that would have been reading that, and so they're familiar with um, the Jewish laws of marriage, and he says you, you've died to this spouse, so now you can be married to another. And so he gives them that kind of example. And then last week, he, he gave his Roman audience another example of, of kind of what this looks like and, and not being under uh, a guardian or a tutor, um, but being uh, adopted or, or placed as a son in a, a new family. And so uh, we looked at the liberalia, uh, and that is a... Again, just to kind of recap, that, that's a festival that the Romans celebrated in, in March. Um, and it was really a, a fertility festival. But the, the unique thing that always happened this time of year when they had this festival um, was that they would celebrate the, the rite of passage for uh, young Roman men. And, and so we talked about how from, from really birth until around 14 to 16 years of age, um, you, you had that tutor uh, that you were under. And so um, during this celebration, that, that son would be uh, adopted or, or placed as a son in the, the household. They're no longer under the tutor. And we looked at the exchange of um, the toga uh, prax texta, uh, taking that off and putting on the, the toga virilis. And so... Um, and we looked at adoption and, and what that meant and, and the two possibilities. And, and the reason that we kind of lean towards this is because Paul uses this same language elsewhere. And I, I wanted to show you this uh, this morning. But in Galatians chapter 4, he, he uses this same adoption language. And he says, I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave. Though he is the owner of everything, but he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. 
And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. And so we can see that that same language and and Paul talking about adoption. And and really, he's referring to this um, this celebration, this rite of passage that people would have went went through uh, to be placed as son. And so uh, I told Amanda that I had to do some correcting this week because um, <laughs> th- to be honest, some of this cultural stuff is, is hard to dig out and it can be hard to understand. And especially as uh, Roman civilization changed through the years, um, you, you find something new. And so I wanted to go back and, and correct something that I said last week um, when from the age of birth, from, from the time you were born to uh, about 14 to 16 years of age, you were under that tutor, okay? And, and so uh, after that, when you put on the, the toga virilis or the toga pura, uh, you were no longer under that tutor. You're no longer bound kind of under that law. Uh, but something else does happen, and, and it's really cool because it actually makes Paul's ex- example even better and fitting for for what we're talking about. Um, After you put on the the toga pura, you didn't have the tutor, but now you had what they called a a curator. And so you were, um, this was kind of a a counselor that would be assigned to you. And so you can even see even more now how Paul is comparing this to to Christianity because he's saying um, we're, we're not under the tutor, we're not under the law anymore, but we're in Christ, we've been clothed with his righteousness, and what do we have? What, what's this whole chapter or passage filled with? The Spirit, right? And so we have this counselor. Um, we have this new uh, advisor in our lives to, to help us, to guide us um, as we uh, live. And so we said that when that happened, um, when this that new toga was put on, you, you were now able to uh, manage your money, uh, you were able to vote. You were able to get married and enlist in the military. Uh, but there was a final benefit that they delayed um, until you were about 25 or, or 30, depending on um, when you look at, at the history because the laws changed in Rome. Uh, but about the age of 25 or, or 30, you became a uh, mature adult, a mature citizen. And, and so now you would have... Uh, property rights. You would have the ability to have uh, property rights and and be able to uh, sit on the Roman council or or kind of govern. And and so again, this connects to, he's using this as an example for believers and saying, this is what we have in Christ and what we are inheriting in Christ. And so um, one day uh, God is coming to restore all things. And so we will inherit uh, the earth and its restored perfect form um, and, and God talks about um, that we'll be kind of ruling and reigning with him um, in, in eternity future and so Paul is using this illustration and, and again he's, he's framing this in the already but not yet and so um, this morning we're going to talk about more uh, about what is coming uh, in the future um, but it's it's important that we see that that Paul says that the path forward for all of us, uh, for the people he's talking to then and for us today, um, the path forward is through suffering. And so, uh, kids, this morning, as I, I studied this week and, and thought about what we would talk about, um, your word for the day is going to be groaning, okay? And, and so, a, a groan is kind of a... <sighs> It's, it's this sigh or, or maybe uh, a cry because something uh, is causing you pain or, or sadness or, or there's something that you disprove of. And so I have this picture of this little boy. Uh, he's inside. He's looking out the window and it, it's raining. And, and you know, we, we don't really know anything other than that. It, it may be that this is the afternoon after he's been in school all day. And, and so now he wants to go outside and, and play and he can't because it's raining, or, or maybe, uh, maybe Luke, it's Saturday, and there's the football game, right? And now it's raining, so they're going to cancel the game. And so he's looking out the window, and he's, ah, 
I can't. This is not what I had planned. This is not the way things are supposed to be today. I was supposed to be able to go outside, play, go to my football game, have fun. And and so he's uh, upset because this is not the way things are supposed to be. And so as we read this passage, uh, the rest of this in in Romans 8, um, this groaning is a reoccurring theme for us this morning. And we're going to see that it originates from, from three different sources. Uh, Paul is going to say that all of creation is groaning. And then he's going to say that believers in Christ, those who, who are in Christ, we're, we're groaning uh, along with creation. And then finally he's going to say that uh, the Holy Spirit is groaning. And so I put two questions up here that um, we're going to answer, hopefully, uh, by the time we finish this morning. And the first one is, is why? Why is there groaning? Why, are, why is creation groaning? Why, is, uh, why are believers groaning? Why is the Holy Spirit groaning? And then the second question is, when will the groaning end? And so that's kind of what we're going to look at this morning, but we'll pick up in verse 14. Uh, and Paul writes this, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. We, we read this last week. Uh, For you did not receive the spirit of slavery, to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with Him, in order that we may also be glorified with Him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it. In hope or in expectation uh, that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of uh, obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we await, uh, as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God and All things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Okay, so our first question is, is why is there groaning? And Paul says that creation groans because it was subjected to futility. And so this is a a reference or a hyperlink back to Genesis and how uh, Adam's choice affected all of creation. And so when we think back to uh, Genesis 3, uh, the ground, um, everything that that everything that Adam and Eve needed, God had provided for them, and everything He made, He, he called it good, and so uh, everything was good and for Adam and Eve's benefit. But then, after Adam's choice, uh, now the ground is producing uh, thorns and, and thistles, and and we kind of brush over that without kind of thinking of of what that implies, but. Um, You you think about thorns, and and so when you pick a rose and there's thorns on that rose and and it can prick your your finger or there's, you know, briars. Uh, If you go out walking in the woods and they're sticking to your pants or they're scratching your skin because of those thorns that are on there. And so now we we see that that pain is being introduced into the world. Um, And you think about thistles and how when you plant crops... Um, there are weeds that will, will come up and, and things that now um, aren't beneficial. They're actually useless. 
Um, they're actually things that you, you don't want, um, that the, the ground is, is producing. And so Adam's choice introduces this. And, and so um, when we think about the fall and, and how that affect, affects the natural uh, world, uh, we, we think about how creation is moving uh, or has moved from now order uh, and God setting everything good and everything is in its proper place. Everything is, is uh, just how he wants it. It moves from order really into uh, chaos and disorder. And so uh, as Christians, we would say this, this is why there are hurricanes, why there are tsunamis or uh, famines and, and floods, those kind of natural disasters. Um, now there are categories of predator and, and prey. And so animals are, are trying to eat each other and, and things just aren't in harmony. Um, as in the original creation, there's, there's danger, there's threats that are introduced because of Adam's choice. There's now um, people will get sick. There'll be diseases that, that people have. Uh, there will be uh, death is, is introduced into the world because Adam's rebellion. And um, that's also why, uh, as Christians, that's why we are also groaning a- along with creation, uh, groaning inwardly or, or to ourselves. Um, we groan because we, uh, we experience that suffering our- ourselves firsthand. And so um, that word suffering it is a broad, general term that, that Paul is using uh, that can apply to a lot of different things. Um, and, and it's really... It's there for them now, but as we read this, we can insert our, our own suffering, the own, our own pain and, and trials and things that we face. Um, and, and this speaks to us as well. Uh, and so suffering can refer to uh, temptation from uh, us being weak and, and having that sinful nature. And, and we saw Paul spent um, chapter 7 talking about uh, temptation and, and that desire to do right, but often doing wrong or not wanting to do what is wrong, but but he finds himself doing that anyway. And so uh, we struggle with sin. And, and Paul's whole point is this is tiring. Um, this is exhausting. Why can't why can't I change? Why, what's wrong? Why do I still have to fight this day after day? Um, it is a fight. Um, and and it, it, if it's not a fight day after day, um, then it's going to end in defeat. And many of us know that, and we can say, yeah, I, I've been there. If, if I'm not continually fighting this thing day after day, then I'm, I'm defeated by it, and it's going to um, affect my life and affect the, the people around me, uh, this sin that I'm struggling with. And, and, and so it can refer to those temptations that we face uh, on a daily basis, it can also refer to our our physical bodies as we age and our, our bodies are, are really wasting away. And so um, that becomes more and more evident as we get older. Um, we have less energy than we did. I, I often kid with people and, and say, I, I remember when I was younger that my dad would, uh, or someone that we would be around, they would say, I wish I had much energy as much energy as he does. And I was thinking to myself, what are you talking about? I don't have that much more energy. And and now as I'm older, I I find myself going, I wish I had the energy that I did when they said they wish they had that energy. Um, We have less energy. We get tired more often. Um, We're, we're, our our strength kind of wanes. We get slower. Um, We become less flexible. Our our balance starts to, to go as we age um, and, and so, and you know, like our hair, it, it eventually is going to, to turn gray or it just says, see you later um, and, and let's go. And so we, we, that's very apparent as we get older that our body is, is wasting away um, and then compound that with um, we look around us and, and we see our friends and family. There's, there's more sickness. We, we go to more funerals. Um, we read about people that we went to school with passing away, and, and there's that heartbreak, and, and, and we are faced with that uh, as we get older, and, and, and increasingly so. Um, but it can also, this suffering can also uh, refer to division, 
uh, oppression and, and, and persecution. And, and we have to, especially in the original audience who's reading this, um, I think Paul is, is talking a lot about this category uh, of suffering. Um, we have to remember that during this time uh, or near this time is going to be the, the reign of Nero. And Nero would take believers and make like human torches out of them. He would put them on stakes and, and burn their bodies. Or they would arrest Christians um, and, and put them in the, the gladiator arenas and they would fight for their life. Um, they, they just totally rejected Christianity and uh, really wanted the emperor to be worshipped as, as God. And so there's severe uh, Persecution. This is a, a real imminent threat that they faced um, on a daily basis. And so um, thinking about that this morning, um, we, we don't suffer that kind of, of persecution here uh, in the United States, but we do have brothers and sisters uh, all over the world that, that face similar situations to that. Um, and, and we'll be reminded of that the beginning of, of next month when we have the uh, day of prayer for the, the persecuted church that we, we observe every year. Uh, we're reminded of that when we speak to our mission partners, and uh, many of those uh, have to be very careful or, or cautious in how they communicate um, with us and use kind of code words um, to talk about different things, and, um, and they have to be very careful where they're at in their their field, where they're um, trying to reach those unreached people groups. And uh, even um, over the past month, we, we've heard some news from some of our mission partners that they, uh, they found a, an underground group that they can go and, and, and worship with. Um, but that group was is very kind of reserved and, and was hesitant, and that's why they, they didn't know about them. Uh, is because they had to be cautious because this is um, actually putting kind of your life on the line. And, and we take that for granted. Um, when we, we talk to a friend or someone that we work with, we're, we're not thinking this person could turn me in and I, I could be arrested or this person could turn me in and I could be ostracized from my community. And that's that's what they're finding is that this group is, is a, a group of believers, but they're also outcast because of their faith. Um, they're also kind of in, in poverty uh, because they don't have the same kind of um, opportunities for employment or, or making money um, because of, of what they believe. And so this is very real. Even though it's not right in front of our eyes, it's important that we remember that. And, um, and so uh, pray for uh, our mission partners pray for our, our persecuted brothers and sisters that are around the world. Um, and so Paul talks about creation groaning um, because things are, are not like they should be. Um, that we're groaning because we, we have this sense and this realization that um, this is not how it should be. We, we shouldn't experience sickness and death and these tragedies uh, in our life. Um, and then finally, he talks about the, the Holy Spirit groaning. And so you say, well, well what do you mean there? Um, is God groaning? And yeah, that, that's what Paul is, is saying. And I think we've missed that. A lot of people look at this and they want to go into, the, you know, is this speaking in tongues? Is this some kind of prayer language that we have? Um, but Paul says that the Holy Spirit is groaning. Um, with utterances too deep for words. And, and so I'll, I'll give you some examples of, of um, kind of help us understand this. In Mark chapter 7, uh, Jesus is walking around the Sea of Galilee and some people bring to him this person that is, is deaf and he has a, a speech impediment. And so they bring him to Jesus to be healed. And so we get this account of, of Jesus um, putting his finger in the, the man's ear and he, he spits uh, and touches the man's tongue. But in the middle of this healing process that he's doing, it says that Jesus looks up to heaven and just, he just sighs. And, and we see Jesus' heart of, 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 and the pain of, this is, how, this is not the, the way this was supposed to be. 
This, was, this, this guy was not supposed to have to deal with this, but it's because we live in a sinful world and it's the effects and the consequences of, of sin and being separated from God. Uh, another example, um, we, we, we like to memorize John uh, 11.35, right? That's the, the shortest verse. Jesus wept. And, and we think about what context that's in. This is when, when Jesus hears the news of his friend Lazarus has, has died. And when he hears that, that moves Jesus to, to weep um, because th- there's this pain. And, and, um, and then we get to see Jesus reverse um, the pain of death when he goes and, and raises Lazarus from the dead. But um, we, we see uh, God grieving because this is not the way it's supposed to be. And I think that kind of adds to um, when we read Hebrews 4 that we have a a great high priest who can sympathize with us, um, sympathize with our our suffering. Jesus, He knows what it's like to be uh, tempted. He he knew what it was like to to face that pressure and the uh, allure of temptation, although He didn't sin, but um, we, we... Again, we, we kind of brush over that, but he hasn't eaten for 40 days and he's in the wilderness. And you, you could turn these, bre- these stones into bread. If I've been you know, not eating for 40 days and I'm pretty hungry, that, that would probably be something really hard for me to, to say no to. Or if you'll bow down to me, then I'll give you all of these kingdoms. And, and we, we kind of miss that if he had done that, then he wouldn't have faced the cross. And so not only is the temptation to here have all this, but you don't have to go through what you're going, what he knew he was going to have to go through. Uh, and so Jesus was tempted. T- tempted. He, he knows what that's like. Um, he, he knew what it was like to be uh, hated, uh, to be rejected. And Jesus knows what it's like to experience pain, um, to experience the death and, and loss of a loved one. Um, and so it's, it's much like when we talk about the, the Holy Spirit groaning, it's really no different than, than us guys. Like when you hear about a tragedy that's happened to a dear friend, when you hear the news and, and, and okay, I, I've heard this bad news and, and I, know, I know what that's going to mean for them for the next six months. Or I know what that's going to mean for them for the rest of their life, what they're going to have to, to work through, how hard it's going to be for them. And, and our heart kind of falls and, and we just sigh because we, we feel that for them. We, we feel that kind of grief, if you will, um, of this is going to be hard. And, and that sigh leads us, hopefully, uh, to prayer. And we go to God and we say, God, I, I've just heard what they're, what they're going through or, or what they're going to be facing. And um, God, they need you. They, they need your peace right now in their life. They need you to be their comforter. They, they need um, hope in this moment of, of darkness. They, they need peace in this kind of turmoil and, and this unsettling news that, that I've heard. God, give them wisdom. God, give them comfort. And so we pray um, for things that that they will need as they face the difficulty in their life. And, and the really awesome part about this is um, Paul says that we don't even know what to pray for, but the Holy Spirit, he, he searches our hearts and He knows what we need and He's taking that to God for us, praying for us. And so uh, prayer is actually the, the first resource that, that Paul gives us for facing the suffering that we're going to, to face in our lifetime. And so we, we talked about that last week, about how we pray to, to Abba, Father, and how um, Abba is, um, it's really not a Hebrew word, it's Aramaic, but um, if you go over to Israel now, you'll still hear that word used because it's, it's like that term of endearment where here in the, the States we'll say um, dad or daddy um, as a, a, that term of endearment to uh, our, our father, um, but that father word has more weight, uh, more kind of a sense of authority um, to that. And, and we need both of those to relate to God, uh, not one exclusively without the other. Um, God wants us to know um, that he loves us, um, that he is like a daddy to us. 
um, that He hears our cries, that He hears and, and cares about our pain. Um, those of you that are, are parents, you dads, you, you know that like when you see that little one, they fall and they scrape their knee and they're screaming and you run to them because this is a this is a serious thing and your your child's in pain and so you don't just be like eh you you run to them um, and and God wants us to know that that's Him He sees our our pain um, He cares about us and and it's okay to to say God I'm I'm angry about what's happening uh, it's okay to admit anger and and fear uh, or sadness about what is going on in your life. It's okay to ask God to, to fix it. And, and we talked about how you know kids will bring you their, their broken toys and say, Daddy, can you, can you fix this um, for me? It's okay to ask God to, to heal people, uh, to mend what is, is broken, to restore things. Um, but we also need to know that, that God as our Father. Um, he has our, our best interest in mind. Um, and, and that doesn't mean... Uh, Hear me say this, that doesn't mean um, that that bad thing is really a good thing. That's not what Paul is saying here. That bad thing is, is still bad. Um, it, it also doesn't mean that um, it, it won't hurt for uh, months to come, for years, or, or even uh, a lifetime that you may carry that hurt with you. Um, but it does mean that, that God can redeem your suffering, my suffering. Uh, for our good. And so we think about what is our good, and, and I, I realize I had to stop short here. We'll, we'll look at this verse next week. We haven't read it yet. Verse 29 um, talks about being conformed into the image of Jesus, of, of being conformed into the image of God's Son. And, and that is um, the good that God is after, that we would um, be conformed in the image of Jesus, that we would look like Jesus. And so... Um, we, we think about the pattern of Jesus' life. Um, again, his, his life was a life of rejection, of being despised by others. His life was a, a life of suffering. But all of that, that all of that rejection, all of that uh, being despised, and, and ultimately His suffering, that, that led to His resurrection. Um, it led to, to strength. Um, and so um, the pattern for Christian growth in Christian lives is, is a lot like a, a coal, um, being under pressure and, and having that weight, and, and eventually that coal becomes uh, a diamond, or, or it's like an, uh, an oyster. If you know how an oyster creates a, a pearl, it's because there's an irritant that got into the, the shell of the oyster, and so it starts secreting something that eventually will, will make a, por- a pearl. But that pearl doesn't come unless there is irritation. It's a response to that, and it produces something um, beautiful. And, and both of those processes that we, we find, um, they, they take time. There's not, they're, they're not instant. And, and I, I, think we, I think as Christians, sometimes we forget that. Um, I think we can be kind of cold to people when they go through something and we expect them to just, okay, trust God, everything's good, now let's get back to, to life as it was. Um, and we forget that time element, and it does take time for people, to, um, for people to work through the emotions that they have, um, for people to work through and, and pray through some of those questions where, where they ask God, why is this happening? Um, how long are you going to let this go on? What, what's, the, what's the point of this and so we have all of these questions that um, it, it's okay to ask God those things, but it, it takes some time to to work through those things and to be um, kind of sensitive to the Spirit as He reminds us uh, of the truth of God's Word, and, and so we have to be patient. Um, and so I, I wanted to give you uh, kind of an example from my own life uh, this morning. Um, last week we had. Uh, Melody's first birthday party. And um, it was a, a good time to, to celebrate her first year of life and and uh, us being thankful for her. But uh, as the party came to a close and as we began cleaning up, uh, 
I really had my, my first real breakdown since the passing of my mom. And uh, as I was cleaning up and, and thinking, she's not here for this. She doesn't get to see her walking in her stroller and running around the, the FLC. And uh, I thought about the smile that I would see on her, her face, and, and I, I just kind of lost it. Um, and that had been really the, the first time since she uh, has passed. But I was reminded of, of her absence and her smile and her laugh and um, some of the comments that she may have made. And um, the, the pain is, is still there. And, and I know from, from talking to others and, um, who have lost their, their parents or a parent that that pain kind of will ebb and flow. It, there'll be days where everything is, is good and then all of a sudden out of nowhere something will, will hit me. Um, and I'll, I'll miss my mom. Um, and, and But even in her passing and after her disease, I, I know that God, uh, I know that God is working in the midst of that pain, uh, in the midst of that suffering. Um, I didn't, I, I didn't know that years ago. I, I didn't. And there were countless times where I said, God, why are you doing this to my mama? Where I prayed, God, will you heal her? And the prayer wasn't answered. Um, where I said, God, how, how long are you going to let her suffer with this before, if you're not going to heal her here, here how long are you going to let her suffer with this before you heal her completely? There were, were questions that I had. There were, there were emotions that I, I felt. Um, I, I didn't know that years ago when, when she couldn't come to, to cookouts that we had outside and, and when um, we would have family gatherings and she was too sick to come. And, and I, I questioned those things. Um, but I do know now that, that God was working in her weakness and turning that into strength. And I, I saw that. And in her final days, her, her last few weeks with us, as people would come by and visit, and they would say, you, you know, your, your mom holds a very special place in, in my heart as somebody that worked with her for years. And people that came and said, you know, her, her faith, it, it never waned. And even though she was hurting and suffering, she still had faith in her Savior. And she was thankful for salvation and what God had, had done for her. And she was an encouragement to other people. I saw her encourage others that were, that were walking through similar health problems, similar health concerns. And I, and I saw her encourage and pray um, and comfort those people. Um, and she always loved other people because she knew God's love. And so I, I share that this morning because I, I know now in, in hindsight, and this is the way, this is the way it works. Um, and sometimes we don't know um, God's purpose for allowing things to happen in our life. But often the case is in, in hindsight, we can start to see things and we start to see how that suffering produced something in us, I, I know my faith is, is stronger because of what I saw my mom go through. I know my faith is stronger because of the, the conversations that I had to be able to handle with my kids about why is this happening and, and being able to go back and say, it's not that God is, is punishing us. Jesus took our punishment on the cross. But this is the result of, of being in a sinful, broken world. And one day it's not going to be this way. And, and I got to, to talk to my kids about that. How precious is that? But I say all that to, to say this. In, in her disease and in her death, um, it, it was kind of like that momentary affliction becoming a pearl. And that's how I look back on, on my mom's life. Um, and so here's, here's the thing, the other thing that I, I think we overlook. And I want you to hear this. Um, 
in those moments that it hurts so much and we don't know even what to pray. In those moments when we're angry at God, when we're hurting, when we're questioning, when we feel distant, um, the Holy Spirit, Paul says, is groaning with us. God is grieved with us because He knows it shouldn't be this way. I'm sorry that you're going through that. It shouldn't be this way. And he whispers, soon, soon I'm going to do something about it. Soon I'm going to, to fix it. And there was a, a Christian artist, I, I think his name was Eli, just had one name, Eli, I don't know his last name. Um, but he did a, a song and it was called God Weeps Too. A beautiful, beautiful song, but it, it, it was, it's just a reminder that, that we're not in this when we have those moments of, of suffering, of, of sadness, we're not in that alone. That God is, is with us. He sympathizes with us. He, he weeps with us because He sees His children in pain. He sees the hurt of His children and He weeps with us. And He can handle the questions. He can handle the anger. But He wants you to know that soon he, He's going to fix it. Soon Daddy's going to make everything okay. That's the really the other powerful resource in our suffering that Paul has mentioned, and, and this passage is, is filled with expectation, with anticipation for what's coming. And so Paul says, creation waits with eager longing. Creation is experiencing the, the pains of childbirth, that Christians wait eagerly um, for the redemption of our bodies, and that we wait for it with patience. And, and so Paul wants us to know that it's, it's worth the wait. And so he says, I, I consider this present suffering is uncomparable to the, the glory that will be revealed. And I think that's why the, the kind of example of the pains of childbirth is, is so fitting. Um, you ladies that have had children on a scale like of 1 to 10, how, how was labor pains? I mean, guys, we can't, you know, we don't know about that, but... Um, a lot of times you, you see, you know, um, things are starting, they're starting to, to hurt, and, and then the ladies are like, I'll take all the meds, give me all the meds, um, make this stop. But, but when that child gets here, when you see the product of those labor pains, all, all of that pain disappears. Um, and, and you see that smiling face, okay, maybe I'm wrong, some of you are looking at me like I'm weird. Um, but you, you see that final product, and that, that's what Paul wants us to see, is, is the final result of what's happening, of what God is doing, is going to be so much greater um, that, it, that the suffering that we have now, we're, we're going to forget about it. And in fact, you know, we read in Revelations, God's going to wipe away every tear from our eyes. He, he's going to make everything right again. And that's that's our, our hope, um, that Jesus, when He returns, he, he will restore all things. That's our uh, expectation. That's what we're waiting for. The groaning will end. And so then we, we read things like this in the Old Testament, and, and it's, not, it's not just us. It's like the whole earth. And so the whole Bible talks about these, these groanings, and, and it says that uh, creation is going to be restored. And so you read... Uh, for homework, if you want to read Isaiah 11, uh, Isaiah 35, and Isaiah 55, um, it says things like this, that, that one day the wolf will dwell with the lamb, and there, there, there won't be any threat. One day that the, the child will play near the, uh, the den of the asp, a poisonous snake, and, and there's no danger, there's no threat, there's just peace. One day that the, the desert will blossom and be filled with life. The thorn will be uh, replaced by the, the cypress. And so we see this reversing of, of the, the curse that God will, will finally do. And then finally that, that will be transformed. And, and Paul says we wait eagerly for the redemption of our bodies. And, and the reason that's good news is, is two things. Like we're, we're that whole aging process and, and the weakness and all of that stuff... That, that goes away. But even better than that, 
We won't struggle against those temptations anymore, guys. We'll finally have victory, complete victory over sin because of of what Jesus has done. No more sinful nature to, to deal with on a daily basis. We'll be like Jesus and so we await the redemption of our bodies. And, and Paul puts it this way in, in 1 Corinthians, and we'll close. He says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? So this morning, uh, as we close, I hope we answered those two questions of, of why there's groaning, but because we live in a sinful, broken world. And when will that groaning end? It will end when Jesus returns. And so we, we wait for that. We anticipate that to, to happen. And in the meantime, what gets us through daily is is prayer, praying to, to God for help, for those things that we need as we face the trials and, and different things in our life, and then having that eternal perspective that, that this world is, is not our home, that there's something better coming, that this is all just temporary and, and finite, but we long and wait for the eternal. Um, so I hope that's an encouragement to you. And again, if it's not now, that you will treasure this up and, and that one day when, when life hits you hard, um, that it will be an encouragement and, and something to remember then. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. And uh, thank you for your your promises and your assurance um, that there's more to come and that you're with us as we march towards that day, that you you come back to redeem our bodies, to deliver us finally from from death and sin, the curse of of sin and the fall. And uh, God, I just pray for your people. I, I don't know what each person is going through, but you do. And you can comfort them and, and give them strength that they need. Pray that you would draw them closer to you. And um, that we would find peace at your side. At um, peace that passes all understanding. God, we thank you for sending your son to, to die on the cross for our sins. That we could know you uh, as your children by faith and trusting in in what Jesus done. And so, God, we love you. We thank you for all that you do. Uh, Be with those that are not with us this morning because of sickness or because of travel. We ask that you protect them, uh, that you would help those who are sick. And, uh, again, we just ask that you would be with our our mission partners. God, we just thank you for their work and ask that you would provide and, and that you would give them strength and endurance in their their mission. In uh, Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You guys have a good week.